going to start with a reading of Deuteronomy chapter 8. I want you to close your eyes. Don't look at the text. I'll read it. I told you when I started that I was going to announce a day. The Lord showed me that we have traveled, Doc and myself, through a great and terrible wilderness in our lives. You know, God gives you a promise. He says you are going to cross, but he never gives you the details. And oftentimes it is the details that derail us because it is difficult to keep the word that he gave you maybe 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. So the daily, the daily trauma of living life sometimes steals the promise from us. We lose focus and we become engrossed with the size of the enemy that we fail to see that the God who spoke the word over your life will bring it to completion. So I want us to start with a declaration. I want you to know that you, Victory Bible Church, have come through a great and terrible wilderness. But now God is getting ready to announce you. And so I want you to close your eyes. I'll do the reading. The reason I want you to close your eyes is I want you to focus internally and find out where you are in the journey. Because when the children of Israel took the journey out with Moses the prophet leading them, they were so excited when they left Egypt. But they faced a great and terrible wilderness which they did not know they were going to face. And as they journeyed through Unfortunately, all of them but two were lost. So I am a very strong advocate in finishing well. It's not about beginning well. It's about finishing well. And even when you breathe your last on your deathbed, it should not be because you're afraid. You should be looking forward to seeing the God who called you face to face. So death has lost its sting. Death, death is a veil that you take off so that you can behold God in his holiness. In your flesh, you cannot see him. So when you take off your flesh, you shall see him. So I just want to read this scripture before I start to minister the word of God. So I want you to close your eyes. It's not a very long chapter, but I want you to think about every word that I shall speak. The whole commandment that I command you today, this is Moses speaking. You shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you th these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know. Nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. A land in which you shall eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the, for the good land he has given you. 
Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amen. You may open your eyes. That has preached itself, hasn't it? Amen. Today I want to just share my experience walking with God, standing in this congregation, remembering how this congregation started and the detours that God has allowed us to take to bring us full circle. No matter how difficult or challenging your life has been, a time comes when God announces you that it is time for you now to take your possession. God will establish you. God will establish you in this season. Everything that you have experienced as a church and on an individual basis was to test you. That word test is like a gymnast, someone who is trained by a trainer. We know very well those who work out that a good trainer will never let you train at the level of your comfort. That he always pushes you beyond your limits so that you can develop muscle. You cannot develop muscle if you're just doing the mundane and the ordinary. That is why if all you do is housework, you can build a bit of muscles in the arm, but basically you're not going to be cut because you're doing regular work. But to be tested and to be tried means to be stretched until you are at your optimum as a human being, at your optimum. And when the scriptures speak of the terrifying desert, time fails me, I would not be able to tell you of the accounts of the children of Israel walking through the desert. But we all know this because we read our Bibles. First and foremost, God starts off by giving you a word. And when you receive a word, excuse me, either through a prophet or whether a preacher preaches and you grasp a promise from God, we first receive the word of God with excitement. We are very excited. We are elated, especially in a season of fasting and praying. Because then we believe it's a direct word for me. But what I will tell you for sure is that that word will be tested. That word in your life will be tested. It is the formula of God. It is the yin and yang of the world. It is the good and evil that exists in this world. Some of you may ask God, why have you allowed? How many of you have ever asked God why he allows Satan to exist? Right? <laughs> Come on, God. Satan is your gym master. Satan is your gym master. Without sin and evil, you wouldn't know righteousness. You wouldn't know righteousness. So the reason every single time you are tempted, think of it as being given a dumbbell. You're being given a dumbbell. You're being given a choice. Should I lift it or should I wait for another day? Ah, because I won't be next week. You're postponing your development. 
God will not remove sin in this age. This age is an age of goodness and evil because this is the season we're in. There will come a time when Satan will be removed from the earth. We read about it in Revelation, where there will be the reign and the rule of Christ. That time will come, but this is not that time. We are the ones who have been entrusted to develop the muscle in this season. So that is why God does not exempt us or remove sin from the world. The word in your life, when it is received with joy, will be tested. Mark my words. I have walked it. I have journeyed it. There are times in my life, I will give you an example, and I, I'm sorry for using uh, this example because Pastor Gertrude was there at the courthouse when Doc was thrown in jail. <laughs> and people, I stood there, right? To me, it's almost hilarious. It's almost comical. When you see how desperate Satan gets, you know you can develop a muscle to such a point that when you look at evil, it no longer affects you. You just think, these are gymnastics. This is Satan trying to throw his weight. Out of every situation you face, the Lord says that situation is working for your good. I want you to think about that. This is time for meat. We're not going to chew on meat because we are mature believers. I heard uh, Pastor Charity praying that we should no longer be drinking milk. Let's be adults. Let's grow up. Let's stop being childish. When a child throws a tantrum, you understand it's the age of the child that is making the child react like that. But if you throw a tantrum at 50, then I'm concerned that maybe you're retarded. There's a problem. You understand? So surely we have walked with God so long. Do we not know his ways? Do we not yet understand him? The reason that early church could take the hits that they took is they had walked with Jesus. They knew him. They knew him. So whether in chains or free, they were victorious. Because the outside world was not what determined their peace. The word that God had spoken determined their peace. The Bible says when Paul left on a journey, he was bitten by a snake. He was shipwrecked. But he kept his eyes focused. He said, because I shall present myself in Rome. So there was an end to what he was going through. Believer, I am here to tell you, get comfortable with trials. Get comfortable with testings as a mature Christian. Do not consider that every time you go through difficulty, God has forsaken you. That's childish. Please, it's childish. We need to grow up. All of us here have experienced birth in our families. We have experienced death in our, in our families. We have experienced marriages in our families. We have experienced sometimes divorce in our... But that doesn't change st our status as believers. So the external does not change the internal. And what is important is this. When God has allowed you to go through a fiery wilderness... All he's done is given you capacity. Capacity to take on the things he's bringing into your life. He warns you. He says, listen, I can give you houses, vineyards. I can give you all sorts of things. But it is the tendency is for your heart to move away from me. So what God does first is he develops muscle. Muscle in us to take the good and the bad, to take the good and the bad, to take the good and the bad until we settle in the middle where we do not get affected by either. That is maturity. We have never seen, my mother is almost 80. You know you can give mom money. She doesn't react. And sometimes you come back thinking, ah, if only she knew what she for me. I've done so much. How many of you have experienced that? Yeah, our parents seem so like they, they stop reacting. Sometimes if they're really desperate, they'll say, they'll say all sorts of things. But they tend to be very, almost like a monotone, like very even keel, like they don't react. You know what that is? It's time and age and experience. They know 20 pin. in a month it will be gone. So their responses are even keel. They're in the middle. 
because they know seasons change. It, today is a happy day. Maybe next week, I have to even take some of this money and give it to someone else. You understand what I'm saying? So the Lord is working to bring the church into maturity. I remember when Doc announced that he was going into politics, the upheaval, the upheaval it caused in the church. You know, when someone asks me about Doc being in politics today, I feel like slapping them. Because I'm thinking, my friend, how many years has it been? Surely, surely, should I keep explaining the same thing? <laughs> you know, you, you, Christians are the funniest people. They, they, they do this thing where they read portions of the Bible that suit them. And then it's like they don't take the whole counsel of God. I thought in Isaiah, God said that the Christ would come so that the government would be upon his shoulders. I wonder what we think God is preparing us for. Is it not for rulership? Are we just having a birthday party here? I thought the whole process of experiencing earth is to rule and reign with him. I thought it was for us to judge angels. So why are we not taking this exercise seriously? God expects us to mature. We need to put away childish things and take on the responsibility of being leaders at national level. Yesterday, I was listening to Apostle Salman, and he was preaching about the effect and the effectiveness of the church in Nigeria. He said, do you know there is no governor or president who ascends to the seat without the church backing him? That is the influence and the power that the church is supposed to have in a nation. You are the salt of the earth. Not by Mishita with brown envelopes, Mwala Savaila. Men of God. Do you know that even the politician, when he comes to you, is looking for a word? He's, you know when he gives you the brown envelope, it's just to say thank you. But stand in your office and declare the word of God as it is. It is more helpful to that man than you saying what he wants to hear. Because Nganga will tell them as it is. If he tells him like it is. That is what our job is. We are not supposed to be so compromised that when a, when a politician stands here, he doesn't even get a rebuke. You know that he's not working with God. So be the salt. So you were tested. You were tested for the reins of your heart to be strengthened. You know, there's something funny. One day I came home to visit my mom and my nieces and nephews were there and I decided, let me race you around the house. <laughs> that was a joke. I tried running around my mother's house. I think I barely did half a quarter, and the kids were running around. They had run around so much, by the time I reached the end, I think they had run around twice. The reason being, my heart is not used to that level of stress, right? So you run at the pace at which your heart can take the stress. So God wants maturity so that he can put weight on you. Weight. Governance is weight. It's weight. Imagine that God sees... Every abortion, every murder, every gender-based violence, every sexual abuse, every single moment it happens. And yet in his power and meekness, he withholds judgment until the given time. That is why when you say the fruits of the Spirit, God is meek, he is gentle, he is kind. How many of you in a provocative situation can react with the gifts things of the Spirit of God. We are reactive because we are still immature. God expects you to behave with maturity in any given situation. No matter how provoked you are, and I'm talking to women in your homes, surely by now, by sequila na Surely by now, we should not be having shouting matches. Surely by now, I should not be failing to cook him a meal because we had an argument. God expects Florence to be mature. Mature. 
You know this man. Abantu balabu kalimo with a man carries weight. You know we women, sometimes we need to be fair. A man carries weight that we don't even understand as women. You know, umu anakashi goamupela the jobs of a man. We become volatile. We become hot-tempered. I'll give you an example. When a woman is in her home and she, beca she becomes the only breadwinner and her husband loses his job, you will see how emotionally that house changes. The woman starts to shout. She becomes irritable. She stops servicing her husband. She starts to react to the children. If there are stepchildren in that home, she starts to react to the stepchildren. You know what that is? An incapacity. Incapacity. God expects you surely by now. Kuleni. Kuleni. This will come. Good and bad will come in life. There is this thing that we have as believers where we think life should just be rosy is a lie. And we know it's a lie. Because Ecclesiastes tells us there is a time to laugh, there's a time to cry, there's a time to rejoice, there's a time to put away rejoicing, there's a time to work, there's a time not to work, there's a time to plant, there's a time to reap. We know that the earth has waves of seasons. What God wants is maturity. Pakati, yukuba pakati in those seasons where there's no adverse reaction in either seasons. So when he blesses you, don't go overboard. When you don't have, rejoice. So you're even keel. God wants us in the middle. So surely by now, Doc has a rhythm. Living with Doc, he has a rhythm. He wakes up early in the morning without fail. Whether Doc has debt, whether he's going to prison, whether without fail, I have seen that man raise an altar to God every morning. I bear witness. Every morning. No matter what the situation is in the home. You ask him, so Doc, what are we going to do about this? And you'll stand and say, it is well. It is well. And I'll say, ah, no, but I said, it is well, won't. They <laughs> 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 But over time, I learned to take that it is well and say, God, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do to make sure this testimony is in our home? That it is well. So I'll sit there and think, okay, what can I do? What can I do? How can I make things better? How, what can I do to help this man as I was called to help him? God gives us broken spouses. There's no spouse here who is perfect. Nobody, no matter how cute he looks, no matter how well polished his shoes are, no matter how cute she is, she is imperfect. And God knew it when he was giving her to you. So when you, and I've, I've said this to women groups before, there is a power a woman has, and I want you to start using it, because a lot of us don't use it, we use our mouths. But I want you to start using this power. When I discovered this power, it created peace in my home. Your strongest ally, woman, is God. God, your father. God, your father. He has said, if your husband annoys you, he stops listening. He does this. And he looks at you. He looks at you and he says, what shall we do? Think about that. God turns to a woman and he asks, what do you want me to do? Now that is powerful. And I want to give you an example from scripture because sometimes you might think, well, have I love Abigail had a foolish husband. She said it herself with her own mouth. Right? My husband is a fool. And yet, when David came, and he said, oh, we've been looking, we've been in the fields, and we've been helping your husband, who never asked. We've been helping your husband, so, because people have been coming to try to attack them, and we've been helping. When Nabal heard that request, he says, oh, you know, David, you've been, you're a rebel, you've left your leader, etc., etc." When she perceived that David would attack, she got up and went and humbled herself with gifts of food 
knowing the man she was dealing with was fierce, knowing that her husband was a fool, knowing who don't even know what is going on, I will stand in the middle and I will seek, I will intervene. We all know she intervened to the point that those who killed Nabal had nothing to do with David. And she ended up being his honey. Wow. So God even had an insurance policy in there for her. So to me, to me, I, sorry men, but we are the most powerful creatures on the earth. We are the most powerful. Let me say that with a disclaimer. Remember we were one. Don't feel bad. We were one. Then God said, no, if you bali, tete ba fiale, so nala ba ta separate. Vale fiala. That is a lesson for another day. So God separated us. He made us last. There is no man after that who exists without us. Think about that. No human being is allowed to live except a woman says yes. Think that is deep. It is deep. Therefore, therefore, woman, we are talking about this power. We're talking about God wanting us to hold this power with maturity. With maturity, not with with maturity. Because in your hand is the power of life and death. In your hand. The Bible says in Proverbs that a woman destroys. Doesn't say a man. A woman destroys her own house. And the Bible also says that it's by wisdom, wisdom that a house is built. Did you know that wisdom is a female spirit who was there at creation, who sang when Elohim created the heavens and the earth? She sang and she rejoiced. Just like Miriam rejoiced when, when Moses, when the, the, the armies of Egypt were defeated. It is a female spirit of God. Did you know the Shekinah is the female side of God? That power that disciplines, that moves, the glory that kills. Did you know that's the woman side of God? Some of you might say, Oh yes he is. He is both. He says, I will make you in my image, male and female, created he them. You are a powerful, life-bearing spirit, woman of God. Take your position. Take your position under the authority of your maker, not under witchcraft, not under Nanga, not under Miti, not under the false counsel of our mothers, not under the false counsel of other women. Take your position in God. So God walks with us through fire. He walks with us through floods. So the reactions that we have, the adverse reactions, do not really bring the glory of God. What you need to ask is, Mwelesa, if shimwana, nala That's what you should ask God. If you want to behave like this, what should I do, God? Not First, ask God, what should I do? God will give you a strategy that will bring you out. It doesn't matter how difficult the situation is. God will give you a strategy out of it. Trust me. I have walked this walk. There was a time, again, early hours of the morning. That night, Doc and I couldn't sleep. You know, you, when there's a, a feeling of warfare, you could feel the warfare in the atmosphere. And it, there was a feeling between the both of us that if we slept, something was going to go wrong. So I was reading a book. Doc was downstairs praying mapping the whole territory, just praying until the sun broke, the day dawned. At 6 a.m., we got a call from my son, from Michael. And he said, Mom and Dad have been praying for you. 
the word of the Lord for you is, as Jesus said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. And the storm broke out in the middle of the sea. The Lord says you shall reach the other side, no matter what the storms are. He started to pray. Doc and I cried like we were at an altar call, like children. And our son ministered, ministered, ministered. We we're looking at each other like little babies, just weeping before God. About four or five months later, a gentleman who had been sent that night, 20 of them, to come in and attack, who were outside the fence that whole night and argued until the sun broke. They argued amongst themselves until the sun came up. The wall fence, I'm not lying, is about this high. If anyone can scale it, any one of us just to stand on a few stones, we can jump over it. So imagine, imagine that just that night of prayer, God broke through in a way we cannot even comprehend. This is the God who has called you. This is the God who's giving you instructions. This is the God who has abundant life for you. This is the God who wants to bless you with goodness. This is the God who has said, I have called you by name. I know you and the thoughts I have for you are to give you a hope and a future. God is not passing you through the wilderness to kill you. He is creating capacity so that under great strain, you can stand. Look at the crucifixion of Jesus. The Bible says, when the time came between him and the Father, he set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus laid down his life. He was not killed. He laid down his life. He said on the cross, I have power to call legions of angels. We can turn this game around in seconds. But he submitted to the Holy Spirit. He submitted to the fire. He submitted to the wilderness so that God could accomplish his own will. This is what our lives are. They are an expression of what God wants to do in the earth. But he needs submitted people who will allow his life to flow through them. Not my will but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. The flesh will say revenge. The flesh will say mulange. The flesh will say beat him up. The flesh will demand recompense. But Jesus was silent. The Bible says like a lamb led to the slaughter. He was silent. Two weeks ago, Doc preached a message, power belongs to God. Oh my goodness, if you have not heard that message, it was preached at Pastor Tosi's church. It turned my life around. I think those of you who heard it, when he testified and he said, do you see Zambia? Look at this. We have lived in my generation. I was born the year Zambia was born. I was just born nine, exactly nine months before Zambia became independent. I have seen Zambia transition presidents. I'm as old as this nation. In my lifetime, I have seen changes. I have seen God move. I have seen God hold this nation together when we thought this nation would go up in flames. Am I not telling the truth? Listen, people, the God you serve can walk you through anything. Trust me. He can walk you through anything. Trust me. All you need to do is to ask him, which way are we going? So women in your households, ask God, where are we going? Where are we turning? Men, as you lead your homes, you get stuck. Ask God who is your supply. Father, I need to start making some serious money. We're struggling. Help me. Help me, God. He will give you ideas. He will show you what to do. But don't start seeking guidance from places that are unholy, that God hasn't given you to seek. Seek God. So the Bible says in our passage that it is God who calls us and then he makes us go through the wilderness. The life of a believer is traumatic. That is the truth. Anything else is a lie. That's the truth. 
I know those of you who get saved, you think, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. He will test you. When your time comes, he will test you. I give you that for free. But the most important thing is to follow. The apostle Paul writes, he says, you guys, you haven't even been tested to the point where you die. Hebrews 11, it says some people opted to die so that they could receive a better resurrection. We are living in an age where we haven't even been given the, op where it's death or life. We can even choose to be secret Christians. There was a time where if they knew you were a believer like Peter, under pressure, he couldn't take it. They said, this one is a Galilean, he speaks just like Jesus, and he started to swear. He says, I do not know him. You understand what I'm saying? But look at the tenderness with which Jesus dealt with him. When they meet after his resurrection, he's talking about his heart. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my lambs. God is, without being too generous, our frailty doesn't bother him. Our weaknesses don't bother him. I know we think we Christians, you know, we harp on people's weaknesses. They don't bother him. Do you know why? Because he put his spirit in earthen vessels. He knows that he put his spirit in clay. He created you. He knows that you are inclined to lie. He knows that you, the propensity is to cheat. He knows these things. But he wants you to walk in the spirit so that you do not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So the flesh always has desires that are contrary to God. Always. So when you wake up, I'll give you a little exercise that you do. Florence is this flesh. Inside Florence is Florence made in the likeness of God. She is holy. She is righteous. She loves God with all her heart. Every day there's a war between Florence the flesh and Florence the spirit. Every day the spirit man must win. Every time you wake up, tell yourself, Florence the spirit must win against my flesh. That's why Paul writes, my, the things I want to do, I do not do. The things I, re I really shouldn't do are the things I do. Who shall deliver me? from this body of sin, but thanks be to God who leads us into triumph through Christ Jesus. So we only have victory through the Lord, through the spirit of God dwelling in us. So when you are tempted to do wrong, the only thing that will save you is the spirit of God within you so that you do not make a wrong decision. You do not make a fleshly decision. That when you respond, you respond in the wisdom of the spirit and not in the folly of your flesh, which only brings death. So God says, I did all that to bring you into greatness. That is my announcement to you today. Your examination was for you to pass a test and to get an award. God isn't testing you for the fun of it. God is not testing you just to frustrate you. God is testing you so that you can have capacity to handle wealth. I want you to let that sink. To handle wealth. To handle wealth. God did not design you to be poor. I want you to let that sink in because believers have a hard time with that. God did not design you to be poor. He designed you to have capacity to handle wealth. If you've ever been to an Indian trader's shop, you see that their children start to work very young. Have you not seen that? On a Saturday, when they should be hanging out there with their friends, they're in the shops, getting used to the business, learning to handle the profits and the losses, 
learning to take the waves of the different business, the way seasons come for certain businesses. So God allows us to be tested so that we can handle his kingdom. He's training us to handle the greatness of his glory, the giftings of the spirit, because when God begins to use you and the miraculous breaks out, the likelihood of getting proud is very great. It's very great. Isn't it a wonder that Jesus said when he healed people, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. And yet they would go out and tell, and then the crowds would grow. The crowds would grow. But Jesus continually said, I only do what I see my father. So to keep himself humble, he was submitted. Because it would have been very, very easy. Remember, Satan blew it. Satan was the anointed cherub. Imagine gazing at God every single day. And then he said, mm, but I'm a God. I think I could, I could enjoy some of this. And the Bible says, instantly like lightning, he was thrown to the earth. So proximity to God can lead to pride. So the reason God humbles, that's, that's why he breaks men of God. That's why he breaks them. We think he's doing it because he hates us. No, he loves us. The capacity to handle God's glory is not really given to earthly men. Men can't contain, I'm going to pay a million dollars. Bambi no kulofa change, it's immediate. Just now, imagine God owns everything. So he's trying to, it's like you're putting, you know how we women, when you, when you cook with cooking oil and you don't know whether the vessel can hold it, the hot oil, we kind of pour a little bit and we wait, huh? then we pour again, then we, when we notice that the vessel can hold it, then we pour. So consider that you are a vessel and God is testing with his anointing and he pours and he steps back and he pours and he steps back. He pours and he steps. Now he wants that fullness, but he wants the vessel not to break. He wants you to contain his glory. He wants you to contain his glory. Isn't it interesting that he talked about this nation that has copper? I didn't even see that. This land, that's a story for another day. I could shift your gospel into a different gear that could bring a revolution. I'll wait. So I will just help us to stay basic and we'll be drinking milk. Nations that are wealthy forget God. I would like you, if you can imagine in your mind, to take a tour through Europe. Just take a tour through Europe in your mind. Take a tour through China and Japan. Is God the one they're talking about? No, it's their technology, our greatness, our achievements. So the question is, can you contain the glory? That's the question. So the Lord says, as he is now announcing Victory Bible Church, he says, I've tested you, my people. I have tried you. You have gone through fire. Now we are getting ready to shift gears. Can you handle the glory? Can you handle the glory? The worship this morning lifted me. As long as we make him number one, as long as the dependency is not on ourselves. Remember I told you when I came here, I said, I really don't care how unprepared I am. Because the one who does the work is the spirit of God. It's not the eloquence of my preaching. It is the power of God that does the work. So it is better to contain the anointing and let God do the work that he wants to do rather than Florence being so elevated that she doesn't allow the spirit of God to flow. So Victory Bible Church, as God is getting ready to announce you, he has announced others before. Few, even when we read the scriptures, have done well. There are a handful. Am I not right? They all start off glorious, powerful, submitted, 
then as the glory gets to their heads, King David decided, I'm not going to go to war. I'll just relax. Unfortunately, Bathsheba decides to do her own thing. Poor Bathsheba was just taking a bath. The king uses his authority, not for war, where he was supposed to be. He says, bring that woman. Bring her. And he falls into sin. Not only does he fall into sin, he kills her innocent, faithful husband. Then the Bible says, because of this, David, I have loved you. Because God doesn't know how is. When he gives, he gives. He says, because of this, violence will now be in your household. You opened the door. It wasn't me. And violence came in. Absalom rises against him. Adonijah rises against him. So can we contain the glory? Solomon, he worships God. He starts off in worship. Giving God honor. Can you imagine? Think about it. It's just that we don't see it because we don't shed blood anymore. Imagine them panga a thousand. Just think about the blood, the goriness. That night, God says, Inshallah, monap. Na ikila myself. God came down. He says, What do you want? Because he worshipped. And he says, Just give me wisdom to rule your people. God descended and gave such glory to Solomon. The Bible says, People started to travel to come and sit and observe. Kandake, who was an African, not Kandans, Kandake, an African queen from Ethiopia, came and settled just to watch. She was watching the way they were serving the workers. I'm a uniform. She also brought glory and brought riches. She said, give it to him. Because the glory is too much. But what happened? Ah, He started to mingle with his women from the east and he started to lose. So the Lord warns, remember that when you have settled, when you have eaten and you are full, that you do not forget the Lord your God. I was listening, and I'm, I'm now closing. I was listening to another message by Pastor Selman, which Apostle Selman, which was so true, I laughed. I was in the room by myself and I burst out laughing. He said, Poverty does not show the real heart of a man. A real man is only known when he has money. He says, isn't it amazing when someone is poor, they'll come home, auntie, can I take your bag? Auntie, can I polish your shoes? Auntie, what not? Give that same worker of yours $500,000. I guess I'm going to without greeting you. I'm out. So in other words, that humility was artificial. It was only there because of circumstances. So God is saying, Will you be able to handle it? Hear God. Hear God. So sometimes you are the reason you have not seen the day that was promised to you. Your heart, the state of your heart, is the reason God has waited. The Bible says God disciplines those he loves. So, you don't give children things that will kill them because of your love for them. You can't give a car to a 10-year-old because you love them. It's just that simple. So the 10-year-old thinks, no, but my friend, but you're thinking, well, no, Andy, you'll die. So God looks at you and is asking you today, can you take my glory? Can you handle it? This is what I will, I'll give you a way out. In Acts, 
us, there must be an insatiable desire to see God glorified. That has to be deeper than the desire for things. You understand? Within you, there must be a desire to have God, God glorified beyond what you want from him. So that when he gives you what you desire, your heart doesn't shift. Okay? Your heart does not shift. Which is why I said, God has allowed evil in the earth because Satan is a taskmaster. So the pain in our lives is what creates balance. Do you understand? It creates balance, right? So that you do not... You know what I mean? So that that difficulty in life stops you from being overly confident. How many of you have actually experienced a miracle? Like God has just done something miraculous. You can just raise your hand real, real quick. Isn't it amazing that as soon as the miracle or as soon as you receive the answer, maybe two, three days later, another challenge comes. Do you know what that is? God is trying to create balance. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged if you experience a great victory and then the next day a small failure. It's okay. It keeps you humble. Trust me. Trust me. You should thank God and say, Father, I depend on you regardless of whether you raise me up or whether you bring me low because you are saving my soul. He is saving your soul. The most valuable part of you is your soul. Whatever we accumulate remains. We don't go with anything. But you are going to stand before a great God who will say, Mwape, and I present myself. And he says, what did you do with your life? That's who you should fear. That is who you should fear. The Bible says Abraham was blessed so that he could teach his children to fear the Lord. So that he could stand and say, I have walked with him. He's faithful. Walk with him too. That is all. It's about him, from him and to him goes all the glory. Everything else we handle is for us to contain his glory so that we can show forth our good works. So that men can see our good works and glorify who? Our father, which is in heaven. Even the blessings God has for you are to show his goodness, his faithfulness, not for us to show off and hurt other people's feelings. It is for God to get the glory. So I want you to do something. When God, when you hear his voice today, he's speaking to you in the intimacy of your heart. Every one of us is an expression of God in our own unique way. And every one of us has a sphere of influence that is unique to us. No one can be me. No one can be Pastor Gertrude. No one can be Pastor, uh, uh, um, Uncle Ben. No one. Every one of us has a path. The key is to let God be glorified in your calling. So I want you to do something that will help you. When you go home today, go before God and ask him, who do you want to be through me? How do you want to be seen through me? What is your expression through me? The giftings and the callings of God are without repentance. All of us have giftings. If it's music, choose to excel, young man, and say, I will do my level best. Every single day, I will show up 100% until people know you through me. Amen? Every single one of us Write the vision down. That's the instruction. Write the vision down. When Moses and Joshua went to the mountain to meet with God, the Bible says Joshua was the scribe. He recorded. 
The reason Joshua served God all the days of his life is he had a written record. He remembered God on the mount. He remembered what he had said. And Joshua 1 8, if you keep this law before you day and night, you shall have good success if you meditate upon it. Habakkuk 2 says, write the vision down. Though it tarry, it shall surely come to pass. There is a calling that each one of you carry and only you know it. Go before your father and say, Lord, in me, I see guest houses. In me, I see Shalom Christian School building. In me, I see a farm producing food for this nation. In me, Lord, I see a nursery school for infants. Talk to God. Talk to God. Lay it before him and walk in it. Do not turn to the left. Do not turn to the right. No matter what comes your way, take the good, take the bad. Walk through this wilderness until you come to the promised land. Remember that the promised land, God has said, you shall inherit houses you did not build. So there is wealth coming that will pay you for the 40 years of wandering. You will enter into your rest, but do not forget the Lord. Let's just pray. I feel his presence. Father, 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 Father. You so want to bless your children. Father, Father, Father. We are standing at the Jordan and we are crossing over. Those of us who have made it, those of us who have lived through the wilderness, we've been tested with hunger, we've been tested with lack, we have been tested with sickness. Some of us have lost our spouses, but we are now standing at the river. And the Lord is saying, you are about to cross over. The season is shifting. And yes, I'm the one who tested you. I am the one who tested your heart. I am the one who tried you. It was not the enemy. It was God. And he said, I did this, my son, my daughter, my children, to give you capacity. That when I bring you into a large place, when I fulfill the dreams that you have cried out to me about, that you would not forget me. And that you would be a testimony. That you would be like Joshua and say, as long as Joshua lived, the Bible says Israel followed the Lord. May that be your testimony in your individual homes, in your places of influence, in your places of work, that as long as you live, God will be honored. Father God, I am here as your servant, standing bearing witness to your faithfulness, saying you're about to make these people great you have taught them you have prepared them you have tried them you have tested them and they are now here let your glory descend upon them God let your glory descend upon us all for without you we are nothing without you we are nothing visit us as we cross over into Jericho, the armies of the Lord are already stationed. The captain of the Lord's host is already before you. Every single wall, every single difficulty, if you will listen to God, he will show you what to do. You will march around that city. And on the last day, you will march around it seven times and you will give a shout of victory and the wall will come down. In AI, we see a self-sufficiency begin. And Joshua said, the city is small. We do not need. <laughs> we do not need a strategy from God. 
And the Bible says, Ai, the small city, routed Israel and they fell. May we learn that in this promised land, we live by instruction. Instruction from the Most High. And that if we do not have instruction, we shall fail. So give us hearts that are humble, hearts that are seeking, hearts that honor you and place you first. If you do not say it, we will not go. Like Moses, if you do not rise with us with the cloud and fire, we will not go. So Father, I ask your blessing. And I pray keep your people. For you are the one who has done this great work that is Victory Bible Church. It is your spirit. It is your power. I commend them into your hands. Knowing that he who began a good work in us is able to complete it and to present us blameless, blameless in the day of Jesus Christ. Let the blood of Jesus be their cover. Let the Holy Spirit be their anointing. And may they rise in power as they go in to possess that which you have promised them. In Jesus' name, amen.